Um, very good to see you, David, and very good morning to everybody. Um, the voice of God, as it's called, I just learned that, the announcement you just heard has announced us. So um, you know my name, you know David Schwimmer's name. Um, but just very briefly, because we've only got 30 minutes, um, you may wonder what does a PricewaterhouseCooper uh, person have to do with the world of market infrastructure? Um, and I should just explain a little bit about why I'm sitting in this seat and what qualifies me in some way to sit in this seat, which is that in a former life, I was a journalist uh, covering this space. So that gets me out of jail, I think. Um, so very happy to be here in London with Cybos to have this opportunity to sit down with David. Those of you who are watching the program closely will have noticed that directly after this, there is a, another view from the top with another um, chief executive of an exchange from a different time zone. And uh, I should just say in advance of this conversation and the conversation with Charles Lee is that um, there are takeover panel uh, rules at play in terms of the transaction that you will all have seen in the news. So, you know, this is not um, uh, going to be necessarily a fully journalistic exercise, shall we say. So I have my, I don't wear that hat anymore. Having said that, um, um, I was just uh, at a, the opening, one of the opening dinners last night for Cybos, and everybody was given fortune cookies. And it says, it's, I opened my fortune cookie, and it said, every wise man started out by asking many questions. So I plan, nonetheless, to ask many questions to uh, David. So David, um, let's start with uh, not the transaction, at least uh, uh, not now, but you have announced a deal um, which I think in, I think it's fair to say was very impactful in terms of its uh, how people paid attention to it when it was announced. Big deal, the refinitive deal, former Thomson Reuters business, the icon business. Um, data obviously is a big deal for exchanges. Um, it's a, a really important part of the business. It wasn't always that way, but it increasingly is. Um, Thomson Reuters and the, and the refinitive business has gone through a, a lot of change over the years. Why did you decide to go for Refinitiv? Uh, and what does it bring uh, to the London Stock Exchange? Well, first of all, Jeremy, thank you for uh, the question. Thank you to Cybus for having me here. I think it's uh, great to have Cybus in London. We had the, uh, some members from SWIFT and from the STAR program at the London Stock Exchange yesterday uh, for a market open. Nice to see you all here uh, this morning. <clears throat> With respect to the Refinitiv transaction, you know, perhaps I should just go back a little bit in terms of some context around how this industry, financial market infrastructure, has changed so much over the last 20 years. And you, you have been a, I'll call it a professional observer uh, of this industry as well, going back for much of that time period. Uh, I have worked with market infrastructure uh, for 20 years or so. Uh, actually before it was even referred to as market infrastructure. And uh, it has been such a dynamic industry with change driven by uh, regulatory, technological, geopolitical, uh, and economic factors. And uh, so much of that change has played out in terms of how the companies in the sector have developed. Uh, and so you have seen over the last 20 years Companies going from floor trading to electronic trading, companies going from being industry utilities uh, to being private companies, uh, publicly traded, uh, more consolidation, globalization, some integration across uh, from front to back in terms of the trade life cycle, uh, and real product diversification. We are now in an era where that dynamism continues, uh, and we, uh, at the London Stock Exchange Group as we have been thinking about where we want and need to be in the years to come uh, to not only continue to be a leading financial market infrastructure, but also uh, to enhance that position. We uh, have been looking closely at a couple key trends uh, and a couple key drivers of change. Uh, one is the uh, increasing importance of data, uh, data and analytics. Another is the increasing importance of, uh, I'll call it multi-asset class trading, uh, trading and investment strategies uh, across markets. Uh, and a third uh, 
which I should also add is just the notion that the industry, uh, despite uh, market fragmentation in certain areas, uh, which may be driven uh, more perhaps by politics, the key industry drivers for market infrastructure continue to be pushing very much towards a global business. Uh, and so as we thought about those trends, uh, and we thought about positioning London Stock Exchange Group for years to come, we wanted to figure out a way to take advantage of and position ourselves for those trends. And the Refinitiv transaction does that and does it very, very well across our different businesses. How does it do that, though? Just walk us through what exactly um, a business based on its on icon terminals, on you know, uh, trading desks, what does it do for the London Stock Exchange, con Stock Exchange concretely, particularly for somebody who doesn't necessarily follow the LSE and the uh, exchange business all that closely? So there's, there's a misperception out there that Refinitiv is a business based on the icon terminals. Uh, that may be a part of the business that many people have the most, I'll call it human interaction with. Uh, but Refinitiv has um, a much broader business, uh, and that broader business in uh, all of the different areas that it, it has, and we can talk about that a little bit, is what is very attractive to us. So just to touch on a few different aspects of that, the Refinitiv business has two very important capital markets execution venues. So it has FX all, uh, dealing and matching, which are a, a number of different execution venues uh, for foreign exchange. Foreign exchange is the largest traded asset class in the world. London Stock Exchange Group today has no presence in the trading of foreign exchange other than the clearing that we do through uh, LCH. Chief, can I, before you go, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. how, if through FX all, how, what percentage of FX trading would that give you globally? It's hard to... Roughly. Mm, so FXL is one of the leading yeah. uh, FX execution venues. The, the data on uh, the amount of the overall market is a little bit fuzzy, so I'll, I'll hesitate to say uh, what it is in terms of overall, but it's, it's a significant percentage. Yeah, so it gets you into FX. So it, it makes us, a, I would say, a leading player uh, one of a number of leading players in FX execution. In addition to that, uh, Refinitiv has a controlling stake, 54% of TradeWeb, which is one of the leading fixed income trading venues. Which just went public. Correct, just, just went public, uh, is listed on uh, NASDAQ in the US, has done very well, uh, has terrific growth prospects uh, as we see it. Uh, and that is another venue uh, that we think is very important for London Stock Exchange Group to have uh, uh, involvement with. So you have FX execution, you have fixed income execution. And again, it's, it's no accident. I mentioned that FX is the largest uh, traded asset class globally. I believe that fixed income is the second largest yep. traded asset class globally. Now within the London Stock Exchange Group today, we do have some fixed income trading uh, execution within our capital markets business. MTS is, is yeah. probably the most prominent, a very important uh, go government bond trading platform, mainly focused on European government bonds. Uh, but the positioning that Refinitiv gives us in the capital market space, in FX, where we had no presence, and in fixed income, where we had a relatively limited presence, is a very attractive and important part of the, of the transaction. Now, now, quite a few, there have been analysts who've said that the, the, tr the, uh, the, the screen is better the business. I mean, it's had its challenges, let's face it. Bloomberg, um, the story of the screens business, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Bloomberg sort of kind of ate Thomson Reuters' lunch with the buy side, it really embedded with the buy side. And it, it was a challenge for Thomson Reuters for the longest time, and I don't think that challenge went away particularly. Is that not a bit of a challenge business still? So our view of the, uh, the desktop business is that it is one of uh, five distribution channels for data. Demand for data is growing. Uh, we are seeing that across the distribution channels. Uh, and just to lay out those distribution channels, you have the, the desktop terminals business, which is distribution to, call it humans, uh, you have feeds, electronic feeds. You have the cloud, which is a distribution channel that didn't exist a few years ago. Uh, you have third-party distribution, so distribution through partners. And then, then you have on-premise. Uh, 
so on, on your, uh, on location. Uh, so there tends to be this focus on the desktop because people see it, people interact with it, and I think it's pretty well understood that structurally, if you go back over the last, call it 10, 15, even 20 years, as there has been more and more electronic trading, more and more algorithmic trading, more and more consumption of data by computers and by machines, you have also had the other side of that coin, which is a reduction of people in the financial industry. Uh, and you can see that periodically. You know, one of the big European banks just announced thousands, uh, a, week, a couple weeks ago, thousands of, uh, of layoffs in their equities trading business. So there is, I think it's, it's clear that there is structural decline in terms of the number of individuals who need access to, quote unquote, a desktop. But at the same time, there is demand and growth in demand for data. Uh, so the important thing to understand about the desktop part of Refinitiv is that that is one of five distribution channels for data. The demand for data across all of those channels is growing. Uh, and uh, we think the demand for data in general, depending on uh, which source you look at out there, there's a, a perception that that demand is growing. Just to pick up on that data point, um, as, as many in this room will know, data has become um, or is becoming quite an issue between exchanges that own the data often and generate the data and the user base that has been complaining about the price that exchanges charge for data. How concerned are you about the, that debate, if I can put it like that? Some would describe it as a fight. Uh, is, there is tension, clearly. Is this not the new kind of battleground between exchanges and their customers in the way that trading fees used to be, clearing fees used to be, uh, worries about the vertical silo model in, in, that exchanges have, had adopted uh, 10 years ago? Is this not the next battleground which is potentially problematic for an exchange? And also, embedded in that also, to what extent do you think the regulators might start to look at it seriously? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it that way as a, as a battleground. There are some elements of focus on it and some elements of tension around uh, market data, particularly with uh, some of our peers or competitors in the US and their regulator. There's sort of a, an unusual uh, dynamic there. Maybe just to level set in terms of data. Uh, so market data can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can be across different asset classes. It can be pre-trade, it can be post-trade, it can be real-time, it can be delayed, uh, and then it can also be uh, level one, top of, top of book, it can be depth of book, level two. So many different ways to slice uh, and dice or, or to think about what uh, data is or what market data is. London Stock Exchange Group, we are both a consumer of and a producer of data across our different businesses. So across our capital markets business, across our information services business, across our, our post-trade business. Uh, and in terms of market data as uh, regulated by MIFID II, that's a, uh, a relatively small part of the data that we uh, provide overall. I believe it's somewhere less than 5% of the revenue across the London Stock Exchange Group. And we have many other products that are uh, data that are not market, uh, market data under MIFID II. I think, to your point, uh, the, uh, there has been a focus on uh, market data from a regulatory perspective. Uh, in terms of MIFID II, MIFIR, we think that that has generally been constructive, has generally had a, a positive impact. Uh, on transparency and standardization uh, in terms of the, the distribution of data. We think there is room for improvement uh, in terms of some of the disclosures, some of the pricing. But by and large, we believe that the, the construct that exists today, and by that I mean the, the reasonable commercial basis uh, and display, delayed disclosure construct uh, that is the current regime, we think that works pretty well. 
uh, and we would not advocate a, a substantive change there. Uh, the European Commission, ESMA, are currently looking at that, uh, and we and others have made some submissions along those lines. Uh, but by and large, our pricing uh, is in line with our European peers. And, you know, of course, given the sensitivity of this, this issue, we have looked at our pricing. Uh, and if you go back over the last 15 years, uh, our uh, pricing for market data has gone up below inflation levels. Uh, and as you know, inflation levels have been pretty low. Would it continue to do that after, in a post refinitive world, do you think? Uh, I would expect it would. Because you've got shareholders, you know, who will be going, yeah. uh, licking the, their chops at this the, ability the driver, to charge for data. Yeah. The driver of the refinitive trans transaction is not about creating market power for data or data distribution. Uh, there are very attractive synergies across both the capital markets business and the data business. But when I say the data business, I'm not talking about market data. So, for example, Refinitiv has uh, a uh, very attractive, uh, very substantial data set around ESG. Uh, and I think this group probably, the, the market community is very familiar with how important ESG, ESG has become. Yeah. Uh, we, within our information services business uh, and our index business, have a substantial business in ESG products. Okay. Uh, and the notion that we can use uh, refinitiv data that is a very attractive data set for ESG with our index products to enhance our index products uh, is one example of a, a very attractive synergy there. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, let's pivot straight to the world's fastest growing region, Asia. Um, and I don't need to tell anybody here, least of all you, um, that most of the capital raisings, generally speaking, take place in Asia, specifically Hong Kong. Um, China's capital market is massive. Um, wealth is being created in Asia at a rate, and this is not a new thing, but it has been happening for the last five at least years, at a rate that is of an order of magnitude faster than anywhere else in the world. Um, does you know, the London Stock Exchange, I think it's fair to say, historically has not had the most robust Asia strategy. Let's put it that way. And I say that, in, I'm putting this in the past. I'm not putting this on your desk, just to stress. Um, does Refinitiv do, you, do anything for you in Asia terms? And if not, why not actually look at this transaction mm. seriously that's just come on your desk? So, a, a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, the Refinitiv transaction is very helpful for us in Asia, uh, in China specifically, but in Asia broadly. So just to put some numbers around that, Refinitiv is in 190 countries around the world. Uh, Refinitiv has uh, a uh, substantial presence in China itself. Uh, I believe over 1,000 people in China. Uh, but also operates in many other countries in Asia. Uh, it also has a very substantial presence in the world's uh, largest capital market, the U.S. Uh, and so one of the other very attractive elements of the Refinitiv transaction is that it truly globalizes the London Stock Exchange Group. We are, I would say, a global business today. We have 700 people uh, in the U.S. We have over 1,000 people in Asia. But much of our business is focused on Europe. And with the Refinitiv transaction, uh, we will transform into being a truly global company diversified across the Americas, Europe, and Asia, including a very strong presence uh, serving customers, uh, clients in China as well. Just drill down for us, if you will, how having 1,000 people in China with Refinitiv gives, helps to, basically allows you to say, we're, we're going to globalize the business. To me, that sounds like it gets you some of the way in a, in a certain aspect. But if you really were to globalize the business, you'd have, you'd do other stuff in Asia, wouldn't you? I should, I should talk about the other stuff. Yeah. So We can talk about other stuff. Yes. <laughs> uh, so let's put Refinitiv aside for a moment uh, and talk about in terms of other stuff, what we are doing uh, directly in China. So 
in June, I believe it was, we launched the Shanghai London Stock Connect, uh, which is an opportunity, it's the first of its kind in terms of this kind of Stock Connect, uh, that allows Chinese A shares, so companies that are listed domestically in China, uh, in this case in Shanghai, to list a GDR on the London Stock Exchange and raise capital outside of China in uh, international markets. How many have come so far? So far we have had one, uh, and we have another one coming in the pipeline. Uh, and it's uh, the first one we think has been uh, a success. If you look at the discount uh, for the a sh relative to the A share trading, uh, the discount on the London GDRs is a lower discount, i.e. a tighter discount relative to where shareholders uh, could get that, for example, through the Hong Kong Stock Connect. Okay. So that, uh, we think, has proven to be very attractive for that uh, particular company, and we uh, hope and expect to see more coming soon. Okay. Um, that leads me very quickly, again, slightly time-pressed. In your document where you rejected the Hong Kong offer, you, talk, you basically said, guys, we've got, you know, we're, we're tied up with Shanghai, thank you very much. We see our future with Shanghai which is fine. I mean, it, you know, that sounds as, as good as far as it goes. But Shang the opening up of China's capital markets has been a slow, gradual process, as you know very well. Um, Shanghai is a very different animal from Hong Kong. It's moving at a slower pace. There are a lot of other issues going on in terms of C the regulators, CSRC. They're being very careful, very incremental from what I have been reading. Hong Kong is, is, has been open to the rest of the world for the longest time. Its proposition seems to be, you know, if, if, you, if you hitch your wagon to us, you, things will move faster. You know, the flows will be much easier. Um, it sounds like you don't buy that. I think if you look at the transformation of China and China's capital markets over the last 15 years or so, it has been nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, I think we view the capital controls uh, around the Chinese market as uh, constantly evolving, and the trend is that they are uh, slowly but surely being removed. Uh, and if you look a week or two ago, the QFI caps were removed. Uh, last week, Euroclear was talking, ab uh, they were talking about uh, being able to work with uh, RMB bonds directly as collateral. Uh, so each of these steps uh, are sort of steps in kind of the incremental removal of capital controls uh, around China. Uh, and we see that as sort of the inevitable path. We have invested for years in our relationship directly with Shanghai. Uh, the Shanghai Stock Connect uh, has been in the works since, I believe, 2015. We uh, uh, value that partnership. We think it's mutually beneficial. Uh, and uh, we take a, we've been around 300 years, so we don't take a short-term perspective on what might be sort of a, a quick way to access something that might not be around uh, or might not have a, a very strong competitive position uh, for a sustainable period. Just very quickly, this is a question which gets asked particularly a lot in New York, London, and in, a, in Singapore, for example. Which, you know, how do you see Shanghai and Hong Kong as financial centers? Just very quickly, maybe in a minute. Which do you think is going to be the dominant financial center if it's possible to be binary about it like that? Uh, for the long term, for the financial center for China, we, uh, we view Shanghai as the financial center okay, for China. Great. Yeah. Very quickly, because we've got just under four minutes. Brexit very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, elephant in the room. Um, the BIS, Bank for International Settlements, came out with a report not so long ago um, noting that, and this may tie into your FX point earlier on, that F London has grown as an FX center since the referendum. It's also grown as an OTC derivatives center since the referendum. Um, in a sort of Brexit, post-Brexit scenario, do you see, what risks do you see to that, if any, in terms of London as a financial center? Uh, I think there's been a lot of discussion around the potential Brexit risks. Uh, I guess what I, I can comment on how we are prepared. 
uh, for Brexit, and we spent a lot of time preparing for it. We would prefer a managed transition, but we will uh, be prepared really whatever may come. Uh, we have a diversified business, as I talked about earlier, in terms of uh, our global positioning. By currency, we're roughly a third, a third, a third in terms of sterling, uh, euro, and dollar. Uh, so we're pretty diversified business. The, the big focus for us has been on our clearing business. Uh, and there was a, has been a lot of concern or speculation in the market as to whether we would continue to be, be able to continue providing our clearing business to EU domiciled market participants. Uh, because of the recognition by uh, the European Commission, ESMA, the European Central Bank, various other important stakeholders in Europe, at the end of last year, the European Commission uh, recognized that uh, LCH should be allowed to continue providing clearing to market participants uh, in Europe. Uh, ESMA formalized that in February. That is a one-year temporary equivalence recognition. So it technically expires March of 2020, which is one year after the original March 29th Brexit date. Uh, we hope and expect, uh, and we, we think that uh, the various decision makers are uh, aligned on this, but we hope and expect that there will be an extension uh, of that uh, temporary equivalence recognition until uh, what is known as EMER 2.2 comes into force. Uh, that will probably come into force uh, late 2020. So EMER 2.2 is legislation in the EU under which third party, i.e. non-EU clearinghouses, can apply for permanent recognition. And under that regime, uh, we plan to apply for that permanent recognition, and therefore we hope that there will be no further questions or concerns about our positioning with respect to okay. Brexit. Um, we have one minute left, and it's a question which I, um, I'm going to be asking you, and I'm also going to ask Charles, and it has nothing to do with what we've been talking about, um, other than it, it deals with the exchange business. We live at a time when the, the purpose in business, the purpose for business, is absolutely front and center of the uh, news pages and of our lives. What is, how should exchanges articulate their purpose in society? So, London Stock Exchange Group supports global financial stability uh, and sustainable economic growth. We work with uh, companies, asset managers, governments, uh, individuals to help them allocate capital, to help them fund innovation, uh, to help them manage risk, to help them uh, create jobs. Uh, and it's because of that, because of our role really as uh, almost as an engine room, if you will, uh, of the capital markets and therefore of the economy. Uh, we, are, our people, take that very seriously. That is in many ways what makes us a systemically important company uh, and systemically important market infrastructure. So we take that responsibility to the markets very seriously. We take that responsibility to uh, regulators, to governments, uh, to our our customers, our clients, our members. Uh, and it's very, it, it, uh, as I said earlier, London Stock Exchange Group has been around for 300 years or so. Uh, and although we are now, of course, a uh, publicly traded private company, uh, and we uh, try to take good care of our shareholders, we also have this much broader uh, social utility in terms of that role as systemic market infrastructure. Great. David Schumer, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.